Hey, everybody. Um, so anyway, just a little bit of a backstory. I was originally going to come here and give a presentation on automated governance and all this cool stuff I've been really focused on. And, um, and um, a couple of times in the DevOps sort of history, some young people have committed suicide. And I'll tell you the story of a couple. And there was a gentleman about a month ago that I felt like he was on my watch. And, and to the credit of... Um, of the organizers of this, like I, I threw a sort of monkey wrench. I said, hey, I know you want me to come talk about a new book I have, and like it's all about automated governance, would like be like so to, like cool stuff to talk about at a Dever conference. I said, do you think you'd want to um, do a presentation on uh, burnout? And by the way, you guys don't know, but I'm on the core organizer list, so I see all your conversations. <laughs> I was trying to tell all the local DevOps, like I'm one of the original sort of DevOps days, so I see. Fortunately, they didn't say anything nasty about me. They said all good things. And they all unanimously agreed that this would be a good thing to do this. So um, uh, it, I normally, um, you know, I, I don't know a better word to use than sort of our brand and my brand. And so normally I get up here and I really want to impress you about how knowledgeable I am and I want to make you laugh and I want to, you know, and, and I'm known for those type of presentations. This is not that presentation. This is a somber presentation, but I believe that the same reason I asked the organizers to be able to give this presentation is the reason I want to do it is I don't want any more people to die on my watch. Right, so anyway. Anyway, just a little bit about me. Um, I've written a fair amount of books. I've been doing this for an awful long time. I've done like 12 startups. I've written like 12 books. Um, I will be giving away that book called Investments Unlimited, which is not about investing, by the way. <laughs> so it was a terrible name. It's actually a story, it's sort of Phoenix Project-like story for security. Um, and then I'm really proud of a book that I um, took me 10 years to write and it's actually on Amazon right now. You can pre-order it. It's about Dr. Deming, and literally it's, uh, it's sort of my, um, maybe my white whale. I currently work for a company called Costly. Uh, if you don't want to know more about that, just ping me or look me up or whatever, so. Um, and like, there's no such thing as a shameless plug. They're just plugs. So this is, and I'm pretty proud, is the book that I've been working on for 10 years. It's, like, I've written a bunch of books as a co-author with other people. This is the first book I've written by myself. So it's pretty cool to see your book on Amazon that you've written all by yourself. Like, um, it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm very excited about this book. Um, anyway, we start. This is my experience of burnout. I, I don't want you to take anything clinical away from this. I'm not a professional. I'm giving no advice. I'm just telling you some stories that I've learned that um, help, maybe help people think about it, right? So, but be really clear, there's nothing I say or should be taken as if that I have any clinical advice because I am not an expert. Um, Edward Munch, you probably heard Edward Munch, The Scream, right? The, um, you know, it's a famous painting. I, I love Edward Munch because maybe it's the dark side of me, but. I think that, like, more than the scream, this picture is called Red Virginia Creeper. And I think it describes burnout probably in every industry, but, like, certainly in our industry. You know, somewhere, I, I, I know Julie asked the audience, she shared, I wasn't here yesterday. In fact, I was kind of suffering a little bit of burnout myself yesterday. <laughs> but she shared her slides with me, and, like, and she asked y'all, and, and I, I heard, like, a third, which is usually, you know, it's actually higher in most cases. So this is a red Virginia creeper. Burnout is, it, it just always amazes me is when, the, when the sort of conversation dies and we're not talking about it, how it's just still there. And it's just like sitting there like a plague. Um, so uh, I think Julie covered this yesterday. There's a gentleman, uh, Herbert Frudenbeger, who basically described this idea of burnout uh, like 1970. But what's interesting is it was actually, there's a lot more literature. One of the interesting things about burnout is um, most of the knowledge we have about it, it comes from academia. So it really isn't a science. And, but probably more, and here's the other thing too, like 
Um, I'll, I'll mention uh, somebody, doc, Dr. Christina Maslach, who is the single most authoritative person on occupational burnout. I actually wanted to talk to her before this presentation. I talked to her yesterday. And, um, you know, and it, there's like, one of the things I didn't understand when I first started talking about burnout about eight years ago was the relationship between suicidal ideation and, and burnout. And it's not clear, but the, the, in the Japanese culture, they've done a lot more research on the relationship between sort of burnout and, um, and suicide, or death, what they call sort of death by, or so this is death by overwork. So this is, um, and there's like really good um, research, government research, something that we really haven't done here. In fact, most of the research, again, here is more academic. And the truth is, the academics don't really agree on what burnout really is. So there's um, this other um, sort of form. This is like an extreme form, which is actually um, a term that refers to suicide, particularly suicide. So again, I just wanted to point out um, that there's a lot more information about this topic if you, um, and these slides will be available. In fact, the slides that they probably gave you have been changed, so I'll make sure you get an updated copy. But uh, if you wanted to learn a lot more about the research, there was a lot more research done as the relationship between suicide and burnout. So, so my story with I was at burnout. I didn't choose burnout. Burnout chose me because, uh, like again, sometimes I look at this again and I like can't help but cry. But, like so, um, the DevOps LA. Um, I had been going there for like since about 2013, maybe 12, every year. And this young gentleman, Carlos would always come up to me, just like a couple of people I met today, like, in, like you would just come up and we'd meet at conferences and you'd sort of ask me questions and I'd sort of mentor. And this young gentleman wanted to do a startup. And so two years prior to, you know, he'd say, John, what do I do? How do I do a startup? What should I know? I'm like, and, I, and he was just incredibly polite and like just treated me, you know, just, you know, like, I, which, I mean, I, there was just, he was a beautiful young man. So I show up in 2015, and I have breakfast um, with Nathan Harvey, and he says, did you hear about, and I'm terrible at names, like I've been terrible, I can blame it on old age, but the truth of the matter is I've been terrible at names my whole life. Um, and he says, did you hear about the suicide of this Claros Chloroforest? And I'm like, no, oh, that's terrible, you know. And then I'm about to, I'm doing the closing keynote that day, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sort of like, in my mind, I'm like, where is this kid? I don't see him anywhere, right? And I'm sort of like, and, but I'm not like connecting the dots. And then they start off the session, the open session with, can we have a moment of silence? <laughs> and it, I'll try not to curse too much, but it fucking hit me. It was him. And then they showed his Twitter handle. I went out of the room, I, I, like, I, I called my wife, I'm like, I gotta come home. She's like, you can't come home. You got the afternoon keynote. I'm like, I can't, can't speak. She's like, God bless my wife. She's like, she talked me off the ledge, and I, I spent the rest of the day. But, but I was so. I mean, look at this young man. I mean, everything you see in that picture is like, like he was so like awesome, right? And so, I had to write a blog article about this. I mean, I like, I like. Like, I'm not doing this for promotion, like, okay, I'm taking advantage of people's debts. That's not what this is about, right? I just had to get it out. And, and there was sort of interesting things that happened. There was a guy named Stephen Nelson Smith, uh, one of the early pioneers in Chef. He wrote a book called Test Driven Development with Chef, right? It was, it, was, it was a critical book. In fact, it was the first book that actually even talked about using containers way before Docker for high-scale testing, right? And he was in Tel Aviv DevOps, and he's speaking, and I'm there in the back of the room, and he says, yeah, last year I almost committed suicide. And the whole room, like Stephen Smith is like, you know, sort of a, an icon. He was about eight or 10 of us that were original DevOps days in Get. He was one of them. So I go up and I hug him, I'm like, oh my God, you know, don't ever, like you call me, you know, like, but like it knocked my socks off, right? And then there was another gentleman sort of in the AWS out of Atlanta committed suicide. But when this kid, it was like, okay, this enough is enough. So I wrote this blog article, and over the next three or four days, we had 300 comments. It's getting emails. It was, I'd get emails from, from, every, from somebody who'd been in the industry for six months, 
or somebody who's been in the industry for 25 years, everyone would start with, please don't tell anybody, but let me tell you my story. And I had, when it, that red Virginia creeper, it was like, oh my God, like, this is far worse than anybody could have imagined. So I wrote this blog article, it's still out there. And um, so then, okay, so I, I started doing keynotes. There's some videos out there where like people would invite me to do a keynote on burnout and I would start with like, I will just tell you my experience. I can't give you any therapeutic. Um, and you know, I did that for a couple of years and then sort of the, the noise level of the discussion you know, it, it pops up periodically. And then about a little over a year ago, I get a call from this gentleman called Jesse, Jesse Ketsey. And we're, we're, me and my family, like it's really cool. Like one of the things I love about Disney, my 25 year old, my 21 year old still want to go to Disney with me and my wife, like that's pretty cool. So we're at a Disney property. And if you're um, part of the member, you get to go an, er an hour early. So we're about to hop on the bus and I get this call. And one of the things I always say, it's like if you're within my sphere and you're thinking about you need help, call me, right? Um, I actually, as a side note, at a DevOps Day in Amsterdam, I gave this presentation on burnout and like it was one of those ones, the room is packed, I like did a great job and I just want to run off, get water. Because you know, sometimes when you're speaking, you're just like, the only thing I'm thinking about is getting off the stage and go get some cold water. And as I'm going out like a door like that, there's this young man, he says, John, can I talk to you? I'm like, just hold on one minute, and, I'm, and, I, and I turn, I see a little bit of a teardrop in his eye. I'm like, holy shit. You know, I just said in my presentation, if you're within my eardrop, and I almost ignored this guy. And it turns out, like, he, we went for about an hour and a half and sat down, and he was crying and talking about burnout. And so, like, it, it, you know, it can catch you off guard. Like, if you want to be that person that tells people, I want to be there and help you, like, you got to show up. So this guy, Jesse, calls me as we're leaving for the bus with my family. And when you have 21 and 25-year-old kids, you cherish any time they want to spend with you, right? Uh, so some of you older people know that, right? And, um, and he calls, and I, I get the sense that this is a suicide situation. So I'm like, honey, <laughs> oh, I hate to do this, but go there. I'll meet you at the park. So I got on the phone with him. And the interesting thing was he'd come through the tunnel. He'd made it through. He wanted to call me because he knew I did podcasts. He knew I talked about it, And he wanted to tell his story about how he almost committed suicide and how his journey was to get through it and how he went to a clinic and how, um, like, it's a two-part. I mean, we probably did an hour and a half of, of podcasts. He even had, like, a code word with his wife. Like, he had figured this out. And he, the only reason he wanted to do this was to save people's lives. Like, like, that's why he wanted to be on this podcast. Like, he wanted to tell people that if you go through what I went through, there is a way out. Here's how I found my way out of it. And he was classic technician, right? Like, like he, he literally sort of did analysis of what sort of clinic to go to, right? That's, of course, that's what a program would do, right? Um, so, great. Like, I mean, this is great. Like, you know, and, and like, it's out there, and it's, it's pretty compelling. And... Um, so a year and a half later, there he is, Jesse, again, look at these young people, and you say, holy shit, right? Like, what, why? He, I'm in Oslo about a month ago, February, well, a little more than a month ago, February 27th, and I get a call from the, the guy that he works for, Chris Blackburn, who owns a consulting company called Leatro, and, and the thing about Leatro and Chris Blackburn, like, they were like a 30-person consulting company. And they literally gave Jesse time off. And that's hard to do when you own a consulting company, a small consulting company, because you, you need people to be billable, right? Like, but like, they, were, they were really helpful. They actually did sort of a watch for him. Everybody watched out for him. I mean, they were surprised. And he called me and said, Jesse committed suicide. And, you know, again, I, it, 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 I don't know if you know anybody. And these are not even people that are like close friends with me. These are people that I've met. Like this guy, I never met him in person. But I spent an hour and a half on it. You know, I spent an hour on a call with him for the Disney, and then we did these two-part podcasts, and I got to know him pretty well. I mean, really well. When you start having a conversation with somebody about suicide, you get pretty close to him. And I, like, again, I was, like, I was, like, in a bad, bad way. You know, I, I think it still affects me right now. And that's when I thought, like, okay, 
you know, like, I, like I need to sort of kick some dust, shake some tree branches. And that's why, again, I, I, I ping the organizers, and I think it's awesome that they, they saw the value in this, you know. And, and, I, and I've got the blog article. It's called This Sucks. Um, you know, and, you know, and by the way, you know, uh, the guy who created Debian, Ian Murdoch, he committed suicide. The guy who created Engine Yard, I can never pronounce his full name, but um, he committed suicide. Like, so, you know, the, like, it's, it's out there, right? There's a young woman, a, a hacker, I, I, I was going to try to add it in my presentation, who just I wrote a, read something on LinkedIn just two days ago. Um, she committed suicide, right? Like, it's, it's out there. Um, so the, the, the thing I like, try to sort of, when I, I did my presentation in 2015, 2016, I focused on burnout. And I guess I didn't really understand the differences between sort of occupational burnout, chronic stress, clinical depression, and suicide ideation. And of course I wouldn't, right? <laughs> I'm not a professional. But here's the other thing. The professionals don't even understand the difference. Again, I, I just spoke to Christina Maslach. She's basically, um, she's a PhD from Berkeley. She is the foremost authority on burnout. In fact, the canonical psychometric survey for burnout is called the Maslach Burnout Inventory, MBI. And I'll show you an example of that a little later. Like, and, and she said, like, we don't know. We, we really have no idea. Like, um, you know, some people call burnout a clinical she says it's not clinical, it's not health, it's not mental. She says that it's chronic stress um, that sort of gets you to this place that we still don't really understand what burnout really is. I'll break it down a little more, a little bit. Um, you know, understanding clinical depression. Now, burnout can lead to depression. I think Julie said this yesterday, right? Um, the, um, but it also could lead to suicidal ideation, but like, there are other things too, like depression. So like there's this weird mix. And I'm sorry if I'm bumming you out right now, but like the point is, and the point I'm trying to get to is, like we don't have to know, and there aren't any clinical agreement on what all these are, but we gotta understand the differences and be able to at least help the people. Like one of the things that's great about DevOps, right? I've been doing this from the day, I was the only American at the first DevOps days in Ghent, right? And, and uh, me and Damon Edwards start with a couple other people, started first DevOps day at uh, LinkedIn in Silicon Valley, right? And to this day, I say this is, this is an incredible community. Like, it'd be, you know, like, what are the conferences that you go to where you can basically walk up to any speaker and have a conversation? What are the conferences where there is typically 99.97% no egos. Like, there's not a lot of conferences where that doesn't exist, where there's a velvet rope. Like, we're a really awesome community. And like, let's be awesome about like trying to figure out how to help people in our community. Like, you know, um, and, and, and I don't think it's that hard. So I, like, again, I'll have some more advice on it. And, and Christina Maslick says this idea like the pebble in a shoe. So, you know, like the, the, the interesting thing about Jesse, and again, not to play armchair psychologist, but I did talk to Christina about this, um, is that, um, that she calls it the pebble in the shoe, right? In other words, it's that sort of pebble that you just can't get out of your shoe. And so even though you think like in his case, problem solved. In some ways I think, okay, the, the problem you have with suicide is you're like, oh, I wish I would have called him, or I should have called him. And like, you can't think that way because you, like, you don't have that control. But, but the thing that is like, like, in some cases, it just doesn't go away, even though it sounds like it went away, right? It's the pebble in the shoe that just, no matter what you do, it's like still there. Um, so, so which leads to like, here's the, the thing, right? And in 2015, 2016, I was like, I, like, like right after this slide, the rest of the slide will not be as dark. <laughs> It'll be more about like how we can help and what we can think about. But what I did, that was my presentation in 2015, 16. I didn't really focus in on the really scary stuff. Cause like, we don't really want to talk about the scary stuff, right? And I think we need to like, there, there's a line that we hate to understand. 
And like if you do any of the research on suicidal ideation, like if somebody is vocalizing suicide and you want to help, get them to professional help immediately. That the defining line between burnout is like terrible, and I'll talk about the things that it 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 hurts the industry, it hurts organizational performance. I mean, all those things are still true. And when I, I don't think I really understood the difference between like any of these sort of like patent characteristics. Like again, if we want to watch out and we want to take care of our DevOps family, like we need to be like drop everything. And I think you know, like maybe you don't want to be that person. That's okay. I'm not saying that like I'm a good person, you're a bad person, or whatever. But like these are the things that like I guess I didn't really understand. Like if somebody uses the word suicide, they're serious. I mean, that, the fact that that word came out of their mouth. Um, there are other signs like avoiding social contact, preparing, like some, like, okay, there are certain things that they're doing. Uh, being a little more risky, now that's a little, you know, a little sort of uh, squishy, uh, externalizing anxiety, like, um, you know, I, I don't know, is it worth living? Those kind of things, um, giving away processes. In other words, the point I want to make is, like we can talk about burnout all day long and it's a good conversation to have. But if you're gonna take watch, you know, then like you really need to understand this because this is a, there's a difference between having a conversation that says I'm burned out. Oh, what's your problem? Let me hear what you have to say. And I'm thinking about ending it. Two completely different paths. Am I making sense or is everybody like, what the hell is it got? Good, I got a thumbs up back there. So how can we help? All right, so that's the, so like enough about the suicide. But again, it, you know, one of the things I was interesting is at 2015 or 16, we ran this um, big thing, uh, Interop of all places, the, the hardcore networking. We were having a, a burnout session, and they invited, it was in Vegas, and we invited um, a, somebody who was a professional psychiatrist, a psychologist that worked on a suicide hotline. And one of the things he said I thought was interesting is, you think having a conversation about suicide is like, ooh, yeah, no, no. I, like, or like even what he said is like, you would think like, if, even if you had like to suspect that somebody might be thinking about it, you're like, if I ask them, they might commit suicide. It's just the opposite. What it really is, if you, he said, the best thing you can do is if you think somebody is contemplating suicide, asking them if they're thinking about suicide. What he said is, it gives them a sense like, how did you know, right? Like, so our instinct is to stay away from it. We don't want to talk about it. And again, like, I'm not telling you you have to. I'm just telling you, it'd be nice if we watched out for our family. So what, what isn't helpful for burnout? I hopefully everybody in this room, and like, if you listen to Julie's presentation yesterday, like, burnout is not cool. <laughs> It's not like, man, I'm more burnt out than you. No, 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 I worked 60 hours last week. Oh, I worked 70, you wanna see my burnout. Like, like, like there is a part of our, all communities in tech that sort of talk about it like a badge of honor. It is not cool. <laughs> like, use some other word. Like, I work harder than you. But, like, don't use burnout. So, like, I, I really sort of, it gnaws me when we sort of, like, miss categorize what burnout really is. And even like just sort of pure exhaustion, there's a difference between just working really hard and exhaustion and, and what Christina Maslach would call, you know, real burnout. Um, confusing stress with chronic stress. There's uh, Kelly McDonald, she has uh, The Upside of Stress. It's a great book. I mean, stress is what like, like flight or fight, like it's where like we survive because we adapt to stress. So there's a lot of positives in stress. So it isn't just that stress is bad. There's a lot of what we can do that stress is part of what makes us. Mistaking burnout for depression. Again, it goes back to what is the difference between depression? What, I don't know, but th there's a difference. And, and, it, you know, and I, I think I'll say this, like, and this is not clinical advice. Like burnout, you can have a long conversation with somebody in general. Depression, you probably want to point them to some uh, clinical help, but you, I think you can have a good conversation. Suicide, no conversation. Get right to a professional. Um, again, converting burnout with uh, suicidal ideation. And then the not talking about this stuff 
um, you know, there was a Velocity conference where, you know, it was after I wrote that blog article, it was that Christina Maslick was there and they were interviewing her and they asked the audience, like, you know, how many, you know, like it was just like, hey, you know, um, reach out if you're thinking about this. And almost everybody in the room said, yeah, I did. And boy, people ran away from me. They hit, you know, like, like so, like shying away from these conversations doesn't help, right? So avoiding any of these discussions is not gonna help our family. So what is burnout? It's a canary in a coal mine. And, and like this is where I get sort of like DevOpsy in a sense, like, I mean, there's, there's an argument to make to business leaders that, dev, uh, that burnout is bad business. Right, it, it, it's you know, it's it, it is the there are some characteristics of burnouts that are basically anti patterns of DevOps, and I'll show you those in a little bit. Right, so it it, it is the canary in a coal mine for many things: depression, bad health, but um, low performance organizations. And in fact, like the Dora, um, a lot of the DevOps research actually have really good psychometric data pointing to burnout and organizational performance. So the lagging indicators is, like I said, burnout is bad business. Um, there's healthcare, of course, uh, lawsuits. You know, uh, bad performance could be sort of negligent. Um, the turnover, we have, um, you know, people sort of leave jobs and they leave jobs and they leave jobs and because they literally, it is really burnout, it's not really the job. The optics, the the, chlor the, the flores, the Carla flores, a week later, so he actually jumped out of a building, right? A week later, somebody from the same company jumped out of the same building. Now, I, like, I'm not gonna say that was the company, but man, like, like good luck hiring people, right? Or, you know, and, and like, it's just in general, like, it doesn't have to be suicide, right? Like, like people, you know, they, they leave a company, and like, why did you leave? Oh, that was, you know, if I would've stayed there, man. And then you start hearing three or four people say that, right? Like, so it, 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 there is an optimization opportunity here to get this right. Um, there's leading indicators, right? Like, which is missed deadlines. Here's the other thing, too. Um, a lot of times, I'll show you some more research by another, um, Dr. Puglio, where a lot of times the people who, um, in general, based on her research, that are some of the top performers that actually are more susceptible to burn it. Now, this is her research. So imagine that you have this trust in these people, and you don't actually see it. It's not like on Tuesday, oh, they have burnout. Like it takes sort of six months to fall into this. So you start, your top performers are missing deadlines, but you're not really understanding it. They're not creating the opportunities that normally they were creating. Um, they might be security professionals or whatever who are in charge of like protecting the brand and just lower innovation, right? So there's sort of industry opportunity to sort of address this. Um, and this is the, the, um, the, the Jerry Puglio, right? Which is, she says, based on her research, uh, it's called a, a BDOC, that it takes six months to get to a burnout. And typically takes two years to get out of burnout. Like, so imagine that, right? And then there's all this sort of, um, Rebound, like you know, you sort of get to a certain state. I mean, if if you look at, so I, um, I wrote that blog article, and then like a week later, his daughter sent me an email from the Jesse Getsy, which you know, sort of talk about breaking your heart. Like she was like, "You're a beautiful man," and you know, thank you for sort of talking. About, but just this is sort of weird. Yesterday, I got an email from his mother. Imagine that she didn't know I'm coming here to speak. And, and, you know, and like she was sort of diagnosing that like he had, he, his wife left him, right? So maybe his recovery and the pebble in the shoe is still there and his wife, I don't know. But the point is there are these rebounds that when that pebble is still in your shoe, like it, you know, like, I, I don't know how to get the pebble out of your shoe other than, and here, I guess here's another thing too that I think again, my non-clinical, observation is that I think a lot of people tend to be, oh, I'm okay now, when they're not really okay now. So you gotta be careful of that, right? There's only so much you can do, but like, like I don't want people worrying about me. And most people don't want people worrying about them. So you're, you're, you're sort of quick to navigate to like, I'm okay now, and maybe you're not. 
So leading to burnout, like lack of control, unclear job expectations, dysfunctional workplace dynamics, um, lack of social, I think work-life balance, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Christina Maslach has done some incredible research on uh, work-life balance and burnout. There's the industry and humanity course, right? Leaving the industry. So, like, Stephen L. Smith, I mean, one of the top chef thought leaders um, um, left the industry for like five years because of burnout. Like, he didn't, thank God he didn't commit suicide. But we, like, I don't want like brilliant young people to sort of leave the industry. Like, that's a loss. You know, alcohol, heart disease, blood pressure, vulnerability, and then again, suicide. But like, again, think about the guy who, the, the, Ian Murdoch, who invented Debian. We lost that guy. So, you know, the, I, I had this thing, the, there's debate on whether burnout is a clinical, Christina Maslach says it isn't, so I'm going with that. Um, what is the science? I would say there really isn't any good science. It's academic research, which is, you know, good enough. But so, Christina Maslach, um, created this thing called the MBI, the Maslach Burnout Inventory. And, um, and it, it's sort of simple, it's, it's, a, it's called psychometric survey. So if you, psychometric surveys are done by psychiatrists and it's a combination of psychiatry and statistics. It's, it's like heavy stuff, right? But it's, it's like asking you questions on sort of psychological um, societal or sociological questions, but is created by somebody who really understands statistical analysis. Right? Like that's my <laughs> non-educated way to explain it. So this is a psychometric survey called the MBI, and it really looks for three categories, exhaustion, cynicism, and efficacy. So exhaustion is basically, you know, are you completely exhausted? And like, I think in our industry, and I've had this conversation, my sort of not my theory that's not based on data because I'd love to run an MBI on our, our industry, which I never get around to sort of kicking off. But I think in exhaustion, we have more of a, you know, like, like we're kind of intelligent. We're less susceptible working in companies that sort of treat us really terrible in terms of our work. Now, I, I make that a general because most of the people in this room are pretty qualified, probably can find a job pretty quick in most industries minus what's happened over the last six months, but typically this is an industry where we can find work and I would say we mostly don't have to tolerate like what they call death camps or death march work. Cynicism is the depersonalization. It's, the, it's typically the, the, the kind of person that gets to a point where they say, you know, everybody else around me is an idiot. I'm just gonna do it this way. But the real, I think the real danger zone in our community is efficacy, which is, you get into this, if I went to back to Carlos's um, Twitch stream, and this is basically armchair psychology, right? But if you look at his Twitch stream, he, went, he started like talking about a week before he committed suicide about how he didn't believe that the place he worked thought he was worth what he had, and, and then it just got worse, and you could almost see it become psychotic. Like it became a boogeyman. And I, like, I can't imagine anybody in the room doesn't sort of fall into this trap of worrying about, like, do they really appreciate me? Now, most of us sort of do that and we sort of get through it, but imagine taking that to, uh, you know, a, a vicious cycle of efficacy. And I think efficacy is probably what sort of harms us. Because so the other thing in our industry, we tend to, a lot of us work in high consequences businesses. So we had this other realm of, like, like, all of a sudden, I'm turning knobs and writing programs that could basically shut down half of the country <laughs> if it's down for a couple hours, depending on what you do, right? Like, where you work and what you're... Um, so, efficacy is an interesting one. Um, and so, it's called the MBI. And, like, the, um, there's an interesting that MBI, for, like, 10 bucks, you can take it. You go out there and you just sort of take this thing and it, it basically uh, asks you a ton of questions and it basically gives you sort of a ranking. And uh, Josh Corman, one of the, our, our sort of top um, security people, um, amazing mentor to me, but he, um, 
they, in, in the security community, I think about 10 years ago, they ran an MBI. So you can run a general population MBI, just go out and do it, and you get sort of categorized with a general, whoever takes it. Or you can run your own sort of industry specific one. And so they ran one as part of like RSA with like, I don't know, about 300 security professionals. And, and the, the data was alarming. And, and the, the, like as Josh said, um, we got tired of losing our friends. So we had to make some, we had to understand this. What was interesting for me is when I was doing my first couple of presentations, I thought, okay, I'm gonna run an MBI for myself because this is gonna be cool, I'm gonna show it in the presentation. So I, so I ran it, and you notice the efficacy thing where it is. It's a four, like that's in the 96th percentile of like really bad. <laughs> and, and so the joke was on me, right? Like, because actually when you run a report, at the end of it, like if you're, I think anyone in the, in the top end or bottom 10%, depending on what the category is, it tells you to get clinical help. So in my, I'm gonna show everybody jokes on me, it literally told me because of how I ranked on efficacy, I should get clinical help. Now here's the thing, I was working at Docker, I sold a company to Docker. They wanted me to move out to San Francisco. Uh, at the time, I lived in Atlanta. My $300,000 house would have cost $3 million. Wouldn't have had a pool. Wouldn't have lived on a cul-de-sac. My kid's education, uh, my oldest son went to a public school, which was the 75th best magnet school in the country, free. That would have been about 150, 200 grand. I mean, like, I wasn't moving to San Francisco. But here's the thing, so, so like, and again, this is a remote, I was like one of the few people that were remote at Docker, right? And uh, you know, so on a, on a Wednesday, I'd find out that they'd have a meeting about DevOps and DevOps strategy. And I'd be like, what the hell? How come I didn't get invited? And it was, it was, it was driving me. It was it, um, just made, made me crazy, basically. And, and when I did this, I realized, Oh my God, like I know why I'm so depressed right now, burnout, because my, like I immediately saw that efficacy thing and I'm like, and here's the thing, I was able to use it in a positive sense because every time I'd get frustrated in the future after this, I'd say, John, I know you're upset they didn't call you into that meeting, but do you want to move to San Francisco? Hell no. Okay, then shut the F up, <laughs> right? Like, it, like it, I, I found it so helpful for me to use this, not even knowing it was gonna be used as a tool to help me understand what I didn't even understand. But wait, there's more. So um, one of the last things that Christine has been working on for quite a while now is this, um, it, it's called the Six Organizational Risk Factors for Predicting Burnout, Workload Balance. And what's interesting about this, and I'll show you the two books that she has about this, but. It's the six categories, but the difference is the MBI is all about you. It's asking you a bunch of questions about yourself. What, what I love about this, this is really sort of the, um, these are the anti-patterns of DevOps. And by the way, there, it's a balance. In other words, it's not looking at how your workload overload or lack of control or insufficient rewards or breakdown of community or absence of fairness. It's a balance between you and your employer. So that what, what that means is maybe you're not working in the right place. So this is a much better analysis for yourself because like, take for example, absence of fairness. I've built a lot of startups. I want my salespeople to make more money than God. Right, like, I, like but you might be a developer who gets very frustrated, like how come they make way more than the developers? And that's a legitimate complaint, but the question is, if you're working in a company where the owner believes that salespeople should be the highest paid people, and it like is one of those pebbles, because it's about a lot of pebbles, then maybe you're not in the right place. Maybe you work in a company that is very, very liberal, and you're a conservative, right? Smaller companies tend to have that. Small as in like 300 people or 500 people. Like, Maybe you're not working in the right place. So the thing I love about the workload balance stuff is it's not just the person, it's the balance of these things. 
You know, and Christina said one of the things that when she's written books about this is people come up to her and say, you know, I thought it was just me. Right, so like, again, I, I think I love, I really like this because it is, it's not just a one-way street. It's not just that's a bad company, I'm a good person. It, it's the imbalance, right? So it's another form of a survey that you can take to try to understand the balance. Now, I think this could be, again, a performance optimization opportunity. Imagine your corporation could figure this out for hiring and uh, all those good stuff, so. This is the two books by Christina Maslach. Um, uh, so a couple other things. Um, the, um, I, it's interesting, I, I, back when I did this in 2015, I thought this quote, you know, uh, men, it should be people are disturbed, but it, he's basically uh, 500 AD, so um, they just use the word men more often. Um, men are disturbed not by the things, but the view of what they take. This is so me. Like, I could give a presentation and watch the Twitch stream, and like everybody's like, it was great, it was great, it was great. And then one person said, like, that guy sucked. And then all of a sudden, like, by the end of the night, like, that's all I'm thinking about. By the time I go to bed, that's all the thing I'm thinking about. Like, so, like, like I love this. And, and um, but, you know, I, I saw uh, about six months ago, somebody put another quote by, and, and, um, and it's this, um, it's from um, this, um, uh, his, his writing. There's just so much there in this I, like, I'm, like Now I'm starting to read like, all of his stuff because it's, it's incredible, uh, like the life advice of this Stoic philosopher you know, in 55 AD of like what he was trying to tell us and how, like, how appropriate it is now. Uh, just a couple more things before I wind up. The, um, there's this other stuff called the danger zone. Like what we want to do is live in what's called a balance between going back and forth between what's called the comfort zone and the learning zone. Right? We know the learning zone, right? Like what we're learning, we're constantly learning. But we need to basically step back. Because even, I love learning, right? Like I'm, I love doing research, but like, you have to like smell the coffee. You have to step back, and you have to learn how to balance between those two. And there's some really good literature on that, and that keeps you out of what they would call the danger zone. Um, I, I think what can we do to help people? Know when to talk, and know when to listen. There's sometimes when you're talking to people that are stressful or in a situation where they might be burnout, the appropriate thing is just to listen and be able to tell when. When do you need to talk? When do you listen? Being vulnerable. Getting up here and literally talking about like your anxiety or depression or yes, I've seen a psychiatrist. Um, I have seen a psychiatrist. I've battled anxiety at times in my life. Like it allows other people the opportunity to tell you things and being vulnerable is what will save other people's lives. Being courageous and just being kind. I mean, geez. I would say, you know, what, what is it the cost of a compliment? Anybody want to guess? Zero. It costs nothing. Um, ben Franklin's quote, right? Like, the Constitution gives people the right to have this, but you have to catch it. Um, I think I'm done. I am going to give away um, free copies of this book about automated governance here in the back of the room in a couple of minutes. And, um, and the people I work for asked, because it is about a $20 book, that if you hit that R code, you've got to fill out a, like two or three lines and just show me that on your phone and I'll, I'll give you a copy, a signed copy. Um, I hope this helped. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a somber way to end. <laughs> but it was an awesome tech conference, but, um, but I just wanted to, uh, to sort of get some messaging out of like how we can probably think about helping people in our community. And a lot of people, you know, this is a plague that sort of it is part of us and to ignore it. I've got a bunch of links that I'll put out. So anyway, thank you so much. I'll leave that up for a minute.